Hello and welcome to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. This podcast is all about our journey into the woods of ourselves, getting to know who we are, where we are, and where we're going in life so that we can create the life that we want to live. It's about deepening your connection with yourself, taking inspired action, and really trusting yourself and your intuition. It's also about mindset. Our beliefs are such an important part of this journey, and there are so many ways for us to change our mindset so that we can more easily live a life of expansive joy. This podcast is also about going literally into the woods and spending time in nature, and how that can help us on our own personal journey of self-knowledge. Thank you so much for joining us today. Now let's get into this week's episode. Hello, adventurers, and welcome to the Into the Woods podcast, episode 464. This is your host, Holly Wharton, and I'm back with another exciting guest. Today, I'm talking with Robert Bendetti about the rim to rim to rim route on the Grand Canyon. Before we get into today's episode, I just wanted to quickly apologize for my general stuffiness. My hay fever has totally kicked up. And no amount of antihistamines or stinging nettle pills or anything is taking care of it. So I'm a bit uh, congested. My apologies. So we're talking about the rim to rim to rim. And if you haven't heard what that is, that is a trail that goes through the Grand Canyon from the South Rim down to the base of the canyon, up to the North Rim, and then down over and back up to the South Rim again. So the route that Robert took was 50 miles in length with 22,000 feet or 6,705 meters of elevation change. He did this solo and unsupported in just 23 hours on a day that reached 110 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 43 degrees Celsius. I'm not that great with heat, so I'm not sure if I'll ever make it over to Arizona to hike the rim to rim to rim. When I visit my parents, I have to go in January because it's just too much for me any other time of the year. But I've seen videos of this trail, and the route looks absolutely gorgeous. So if you want to get an idea of what it looks like, check out the show notes for links to a video where Runner sets the record for the trail. So, who is Robert Bendetti? Husband, father, hiker, and ultra runner, or as he says, more like ultra jogger, Robert is the Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Lifecycle Engineering. As CFO, he is responsible for all financial operations of the company, as well as accounting, finance, contracts, purchasing, security, facilities, process automation, and IT. Robert has a graduate degree in finance and an MBA from Kennesaw State University, as well as a Master's of Accounting and Financial Management from DeVry. Robert is also a certified public accountant, certified pro-sci change management professional, and certified Six Sigma Green Belt. Robert's volunteer activities include serving as a member of the Board of Trustees, for the Educational Foundation for Women in Accounting, and serving as an advisor to the Board of Directors for the South Carolina Federal Credit Union. Robert is also the president and founder of the Global CFO Council. The purpose of the Global CFO Council is to provide an educational and networking forum for senior financial executives to share best practices, to discuss current financial issues, and to learn about current topics related to the performance of their jobs. So, Robert is really, I think, unique in that a lot of people that come on this show Like their adventures are their profession as well, or like a part of their business or a part of their job. But this is something that Robert does on the side, and he's quite adventurous. So on the one hand, he's got this, you know, CFO role in a corporate environment. On the other hand, he's going in these really great adventures, one of them being the Grand Canyon rim to rim to rim. So what are you going to learn today? We discuss what is the Grand Canyon rim to rim to rim and what it's like. We discuss the different ways to hike the route how to train for it, what to pack, what food to take, and how much water you'll need, and extra precautions you need to take whether you're hiking alone or with friends. Because this trail is not for beginners, you really need to prepare for it. We also talk about common mistakes that people make when hiking the trail, and the best times of the year to hike it. I've got a whole bunch of links in the show notes about the different trails and the different facilities and things that they've got along the trail, so you can check that out. And yeah, I hope you enjoy it. Hello, Robert. How are you today? I am doing fantastic, Holly. Thanks for having me on your podcast. Oh, thank you for coming. So why don't you start out by telling us a little bit about yourself? Sure. I'm an accountant by day and have a real passion for the outdoors by night. I love to camp and to hike and to run. I just like being outside since my job during the day is within the four walls. I never really get out. So I try to get out a lot when I'm not working. Yep. That sounds good. 
Yeah, I think a lot of people, especially since lockdown the last couple of years, have really embraced getting outdoors and really valued that time outside. I see a lot more people outside. That's yeah. for sure. Uh, for the past three years, it's like triple what there used to be. It used to be quite solitary and kind of nice to be away from everyone. Now everyone's followed us out there. <laughs> Which is good, but also, you know, different. <laughs> yeah, I got to go further for us to get yeah. away from people. Yeah, bigger challenges. So we are here today to talk about your rim to rim to rim adventure in the Grand Canyon. So why don't we start out by talking about what is the rim to rim to rim in case anyone hasn't heard of it? Yeah, the Grand Canyon is this absolutely beautiful natural space in the United States. I believe it's the whole canyon system is several hundred miles but there is a trail, a very well laid out, very well organized trail that's maintained by the National Park Service. And the main trail people go on is the Bright Angel Trail across the Grand Canyon over the river and then up the North Kebab Trail, I believe is how you pronounce it. And it's about 24 miles each way. And if you go there and back, it's about obviously 48 miles, and that's called the rim to rim to rim. You start off on one side, let's call it, I've always started off on the south rim, mm -hmm. and you go down, over, and up to the north rim, mm -hmm. and then you do it again, and you're totally crazy, and you can say <laughs> you've done the rim to rim to rim. <laughs> All right. And so are there different versions of this route, or is it just this one trail? No, there's a couple of different routes. There's on the South Rim side, which is the most populated. And if you were going to tour the Grand Canyon, most people go to the South Rim. It's mm -hmm. where the most lodging is, the most food. And there are two options. You can go down the Bright Angel Trail, or you can go down the South Khabib Trail. And I always go down the Bright Angel Trail because it has the most water spots. And I basically go unsupported. I try to carry all my stuff. I'm mm -hmm. obviously not carrying 24 hours worth of water. And so that's really important for me to stay hydrated. And the Bright Angel Trail has way more water stations than the North Khabib Trail. Okay. That's good to know. So why did this challenge appeal to you? Well, it's, it kind of grew over time. I, five or six years ago, I was 65 pounds heavier than I am now. And I was on this wellness journey of trying to lose weight. I'd gained the weight over time. So I thought I'm going to try to lose a pound a week. And so for 65 weeks, I lost a pound a week. I lost 65 pounds. And when I was lighter, I was like, wow, I don't, man, I feel better. I feel like I could go outside and do some stuff. And so walking and then hiking was a natural progression. And it just, it became fun instead of a burden. So I would hike on my local trails and then I would meet other people or listen to outdoor podcasts like you have. And I got yeah. inspired by what I think is one of the top 10 hikes you can do. Ooh. It's not the commitment of say the Appalachian Trail or uh, Camino yep. in mm -hmm. Spain, mm -hmm. but as I think it's quite a challenge and it's, it was mentioned like hiking circles that I hang out with is like a really cool, really hard thing to do. So I thought, oh, that'd be great to train and have a mission and something to focus on. So that's what appealed to me. And do you live close to the Grand Canyon? Not at all. I live in South Carolina, which is oh, on wow. the East coast of the U S if anybody's listening from outside and it's more towards the West coast. It was a, uh, it's definitely a flight out every time I go. And the very first time I go, I call it just putting my toe in the water. I went with a bunch of scouts, my son and daughter, are in scouts. And my son and I went on this huge hiking adventure all over the West. And one of the things we did in the Grand Canyon was hike down to the plateau. Have you ever heard of the plateau, Holly? I have, but I don't know what it is or where it is in the canyon. Yeah. It's if you go down the Bright Angel Trail and you veer a little bit to the left, and instead of going down all the way to the river, you go down to this cliff. It's about maybe 70% of the way down to the river. So you don't quite have the hike up but you get an absolutely amazing view. And so what we did is an evening hike. So it was cooler. Instead of being, you know, 100, it was like 80. And we hiked down in late afternoon, just in time to get down to this viewing spot to see sunset. And then we hiked back up in the night. And it was a great introduction, I think, if you're in good shape, because it is quite a hike still. It's a great introduction to the Grand Canyon and it just set a fire in me to go back and do more. Nice. So how did you train for this rim to rim to rim? 
combination. Well, I, so I'm in South Carolina. There aren't a lot of mountains. The elevation change when going down is so easy. I see people go down the Grand Canyon that have no business going mm. down because it's so easy to go down and they feel so good. And they always have a smile on their face and they're so <laughs> proud of themselves with their little water bottle. Ooh. Um, but it's the way up that's yeah. hard. It's 6,000, I think 800 feet coming up the Bright Angel Trail. And it's mm -hmm. 8,000 feet coming up North Khabib. And I am absolutely pronouncing that wrong. I apologize in advance for somebody who's having to hear me say North Khabib and it's Khabib or Kebab or something. <laughs> I mean, I think I'm at 14 feet of elevation here in South oh, Carolina. Wow. I live on the coast in Charleston. I'm from Florida. So I have no ability or access to natural heights. So it's mm. boring, but I just did a lot of treadmill work oh. at the highest setting and a lot of Stairmaster work. Mm. It's not really ultra runner. I'm really more of an ultra jogger. Don't be impressed. I'm the guy who's finishing in last that everyone else clap for is because they're just proud he finished. This is, um, that, that's me too. <laughs> that's me. Okay. I've never placed anywhere other than last. I did a lot of running because I figured, mm -hmm. well, if I could run far, I'm building up my cardio and then just treadmill high setting, Stairmaster high setting. And it's the just being able to prove to your mind that your body is lying to you, that the pain is temporary and you can yeah. push through it. Yeah, and I think that's a hard thing for a lot of people who are just getting into endurance activities because it's like, there's pain. Like, how do you know if this is temporary pain, as you say, or if you are starting to get injured and you're going to exacerbate an injury? It's really yeah, you, hard to kind of learn the difference in the beginning. Yeah, pain is something you can endure. Yeah, You do need to be aware when you're hurt. Yeah. And your body will lie to you. <laughs> and so you just have to push through for a little bit and see if it you will, hmm, does this go away? Am I hurt? Yeah. Am I injured? Is this something serious or is this just pain? And most of the time it's just pain and your body will put up a fight. And then your mind just has to say, nope, we're going to take two more steps. Yeah. And I think this is just pain. And then your body's going to go, no, no, you should sit down on that rock and take a little <laughs> nap. And then your mind just has to say, nope, we're going to take two more steps. And you just keep on having that conversation for a long time and you finish. Good. I like that. I like that technique. And I think it's really interesting how you trained primarily at the gym, because I think a lot of people limit themselves by thinking, oh, well, I can't do a mountain adventure because I don't have mountains where I live. And, and so what am I going to do? I can't train. But of course, there always is that option of training at the gym. Yeah. Oh, for sure. And I would do gear checks and I would definitely hike because there's a flat part, you know, there's like yeah. 20 miles of flat part. So I would walk outside in my pants because I like to hike in pants and long sleeve shirts because mm -hmm. and a big hat because I'm trying to avoid sun exposure. Yeah. And I'm from Florida, so I can handle heat pretty well. Oh, that's so, you know, I would do long hikes when it was really hot. I look like a total crazy person <laughs> in my gear in my neighborhood, or I would walk around like local parks or I would, there's this local walkway where I live. And so I definitely did train outside, but I just knew there's no place for me to climb. I got a 14 feet up and down is not going to cut it. So yeah, yeah, best next best thing is a treadmill at a 15 setting is no joke. You try doing that for an hour, you will be dying. <laughs> yeah, that is challenging. So what fitness level is required for this room to room to room? How so much do you have to spend? I've been back a few times and I think the fitness level is different because each one of my journeys was a little different. So the mm -hmm. plateau, I think if you are in good shape, like you could in 30 days run a 10K, you're not going to win it. You're not trying to win your age group, but you could totally run a 10K at the end of the month. No problem. No factor. I would call you in good shape and through proper hydration and proper gear, you can mm. do the plateau. That's a night hike. You're not going to have to deal with extreme heats. And then the walk back up, instead of being 6,800 feet of elevation change, I think from the plateau, it's probably half that. You're talking like 3,000. And so it's totally doable. It's at night. The temperatures will be nice. Now, if you're going to do the rim to rim or a rim to rim to rim, I think it's completely different. I think you need to be in the exceptional shape. I think mm -hmm. it's very dangerous every day they get National Park Service gets a call that someone is injured or in need of aid every day inside the Grand Canyon. And I believe every month or two, someone dies in the Grand Canyon. Now, sometimes that is because they could be at the very top of the Grand Canyon and they trip and fell and hit a rock and they're yeah. elderly. There was a lady two weeks ago who passed away. She was 41 years old in okay shape. 
in good shape. And she went down to the river, I think like on a lark, like many people I've seen and thought, oh, I'll just walk down the Bright Angel Trail. It's no problem. It's so probably had a smile on her face and very sadly on the way back up passed away from heat oh, exhaustion wow. This oh, is wow. a week or two ago. It is very dangerous. There are signs all over the Grand Canyon that say, do not even go down to the river and back. And what I'm talking is about is going past the river, up the other side, then down to the river again and up the other side again. I think you need to be in, whoever's listening, you need to decide to be in the best shape of your life yeah. before you attempt. And I would argue, I think what I did, my path to the rim to rim to rim in 23 hours, and, and that's no record, by the way, people do it in like 11 hours, huh. but it's my personal best. And I'm just competing with me. If first you went to do the plateau, one option is to do it over two days. Hmm. So go rim to rim, start off on the South rim and stay at the South Rim, and then go from Rim to Rim to the North Rim and stay at the North Rim. There's a lodge with a very nice cabins. There's also a very nice little hotel. It's very quiet, very relaxed on the North Rim. There's no hustle and bustle. And you could take a day or two and you could stay at the North Rim. And then after you've fully rested, fully hydrated, and then come back to the South Rim. I did that with my sister. She was supposed to hike with me and then quit the week before and said, Ooh. no, I'll go on the trip with you. And I'm going to hang out at the hotel and the spa and <laughs> watch TV and sit in a hammock and wave you off. And I'll come pick you up when you're done, but I'm not going in that Canyon. And so <laughs> it was a total fabulous, a brother sister trip where <laughs> she is a mother of little kids and had the time of her life. Cause she was by herself. Yeah. No one bothering her. And she went where she wanted to go and ate where she wanted to go. And she, I hiked down and she met me on the other side. And then I hiked down again and she met me on the other side. If you want to go on a, just a pure hiking rim to rim to rim adventure, I think breaking it up is a great way to do it. Hmm. So how did the reality of this rim to rim to rim compare to your expectations? Cause you had attempted different versions of this before. Yeah, the reality, it's a lot harder than I thought. Every time I've gone, it's hotter somehow. Hmm and harder. There's like more rocks and more heat. <laughs> I don't know where the rocks are coming from, but there's more of them. It seems like the hole's getting deeper. Mm. It's definitely hard. And then I think the other thing is uh, I've tried to take other people with me because I think that's safer. And then mm. one thing I've learned that after I did it with sister, I took like a, a someone who is very high level fitness, a young person and very well trained in outdoor wilderness survival and hiking at very high levels. And I thought, okay, my sister, that's on me. I shouldn't have little sisters. You can't trust them. I'm going to take <laughs> this other guy and this will be great. It's like, I got a personal little bear grills with me in case something happens. Well, I learned two very valuable lessons trying to do this again. Cause again, this didn't work out right. I was trying to do the rim to rim to rim in one day instead mm -hmm. of doing it in two days. And I took this guy, I learned a valuable lesson, trust, but verify you need to check your team's supply of food and water. And that mm. this guy just did not comprehend how much food we were going to eat while we were doing the rim to rim to rim in, in one day. I told him, we talked about it multiple times. It's the thing I like to talk about the most is the food you eat. And he just didn't believe it. And uh, he got heat exhaustion. Mm. Yeah. And at the Phantom Ranch, which is in the middle. And Ooh. I had to make the call, like we're stuck in the middle. And I can't leave him there. I can't, we can't wait. He was good enough to get out. And we were trying, oh, do we go back where we came from or do we go forward? But I needed to get him out of the canyon before it turned worse. You know, mm -hmm. it was just uh, not, I'm trying to think of the levels. There's heat exhaustion and then there's heat. Um, stroke. Stroke. It's not heat stroke. He was just beginning stages. He yeah. was uh, slow-ish. He was not as quick and as spry. And I just knew that we're not coming. We're not doing the rim to rim to rim. I need to get him out of here. So mm. I just carried all his gear and we just went very slow out of the canyon. He was not handling his hydration properly. He was not cool. handling his food properly. And I learned a valuable lesson is that you bring a team. You need to trust, but verify. You need to check every single person's gear from their socks to their shoes, to their food, to their water. You need to make sure they're drinking water because their problem is your problem. It's yeah. just, I was so focused on myself because I was so scared. I could twist my ankle, break my leg, get bit by a snake, become dehydrated, not have enough food. I thought something that was incorrect is that this person brought everything they needed. So a little tip out there for folks, if you do go with the group to something like this, hmm. trust, but verify, check yeah. every single person's gear. 
Hmm. Yeah, I think that's really good. And I think that's something I've certainly never done because I've only just started doing adventures like this with other people. I usually do my things alone. So it's it's not something that I I would have thought necessarily. And another thing I learned, and this is a tip very specific to the Grand Canyon, and I have a little card, no one can see, uh, a business card that's laminated, and it's the Trans Canyon Shuttle Service. <laughs> the, there is a shuttle that a couple times a day goes back and forth between the South Rim and the North Rim, and it's really important because if like this situation, I hiked, we went out the North Rim, and we got out at 3 p.m., and the last shuttle from the North Rim leaves at 2 p.m. So A, Ooh. everyone listening who wants to do this, you need to have a backup plan, which is what if this goes really bad and I'm trying to do the rim to rim in one day, but I, I get stuck on the North Rim and I need a shuttle back. Well, the shuttle goes back from the North Rim at 2 p.m. So you need to leave earlier so you can finish in time at for 2 p.m. to get shuttled back that mm. same day or you're gonna have to sleep under a, a tree and uh, carry this business card in a jacket kind of my outdoorsy hiking jacket as just a reminder that you need to have not only just it's not okay to have one plan you got to have a primary plan a backup plan you know maybe a primary secondary and a tertiary plan yeah and it's just a little card I have laminated as a reminder all the time that I thought I was prepared for something and I was not prepared and it was uh, luckily kind of God was watching over us my friend and I, we got out of the North Rim. We missed the shuttle, but there was one room at the inn and it was unbelievably expensive, <laughs> oh, but God. I got the one room. The only thing I hiked with was my driver's license and a credit card. And I was <laughs> like, so I thought, ah, should I bring it? It's extra weight. You know, I was like, oh, that's stupid. I'm going to bring a credit card. I am so glad. <laughs> that was probably that trip's lesson. Hmm. That's really good. It's a good point. So how did you manage to do this unsupported when you finally went back to do to your, your rim to rim to rim? What extra supplies did you need to carry? What extra precautions did you need to take? Like what, what are the differences? Yeah, I did a bunch of shakedown trips. And when I was in the Canyon on the other trips, I saw people with gear from everything from like just a water belt, or like super young, thin people, like little deer jumping over rocks, they'll run. <laughs> the rim to rim yeah. and they all, they're all like talking to each other and they're all like happy. And I'm 47 years old. There's no happy. <laughs> there's no jumping. There's no talking. I knew I couldn't do that. Like I'm not jogging across the grand Canyon with a water bottle, but then there's people with like full gear and they'll, you can take seven days to hike the grand Canyon and stay in little campsites along the way. I was not doing that. I'm a through hiker. I was not camping. This is not, that could be cool, but I've just never done that. I don't have any tips or tricks about that. So I thought, well, I'm not going to bring a full gear and I'm also not going to bring backup supplies of like a hammock or something in case yeah. I get stuck down there. Cause you can't stay in the grand Canyon without a permit and I don't uh -huh. have a permit. So God forbid something happens. I'm going to sleep on a bench and, and if the Rangers arrest me, fine, they got to put me in their cabin. Ha ha. On yeah. that. <laughs> so I decided I'm going to pack like a light hiker. And I found my ultra running vest that I carry where mm. I put a camel pack of water in. Mm -hmm. I thought that it had just enough space in the back of this pack for my camel pack, a smaller camel pack, instead of a big bag of water, the small bag of water and mm -hmm. the food. And I thought this is perfect. I'm used to this gear because I wear it running my yeah. ultra marathons. And so I have a familiarity to it. I've art it. I know it can last 30, 40, 50 miles of running. So I know it can last 48 or 50 miles worth of hiking. So I was yeah. familiar with the gear and then had to be very judicious with the food that I brought. I had to just very calorically dense food. Yeah. Yeah. One key lesson I want to share on the food is Bring calorically dense food that you can chew easily. Yes. I love this crunchy trail mix that has a lot of salt in it. Mm. And it's like, great. After an ultra marathon, it's like something I like reward myself with. And I was like, Ooh, I'm going to eat this stuff. I could eat 400 bags of this. <laughs> I'll just be chewing this a long hike was I'm hiking the grand Canyon. Well, it was so hard. My mm. mouth hurt. So be careful. The food that you bring, it needs to be very easy to chew, or maybe it's no chew or light yeah. chew, like applesauce. Don't make that mistake that Robert made. Yeah. And I think that's a really good point. I mean, I've found in ultras that I get to the point in the race where I'm so exhausted, like I can't chew. Like I can't bear the thought of chewing. And even like the thicker gels are like, I can't get this down, but like the really thin watery ones. I'm like, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah. Great point. 
So the things that you like to eat, you need to train whatever you're going to bring on to your event. That's what you need to train drinking yes. and eating. And you're going to have some flavors you like the most and some food you like the most. You're not going to put anything in the pack you don't like, hmm. but there's going to be three or four things you really like. You need to save those to the end because Holly <laughs> brings up a good point. You're not even going to want to eat the, like the last quarter of what you're ever you're going to do. And that's when you need to be eating. Yeah. And so save all the favorite flavors and all the favorite food to the last 25% of the event. Yeah, that's a really, really good tip. So what foods did you eat? Like, what were your favorite foods for this trip? I liked, uh, there's a brand of gels that I really liked because I could get a pop of caffeine, sometimes mm. sugar, because it's just a simple carbohydrate that my body would kind of pop. Mm. I like the go apple sauces. Uh, uh, they're yeah. in these little packets. I can just squeeze them and go. Mm -hmm. And then I love Nutella. So I bought a few of these little they're like individual size, little Nutella packets. Oh, yep. And then I would dip other things in it. And that was like a reward. <laughs> like when my body hurt and I wanted to give up, I'd be like, okay, well, if we just get past those rocks over there, we're going to treat ourselves. I think of myself in the plural out there, I guess, <laughs> is uh, with a little bit of Nutella. And if you put any Nutella on anything, it becomes absolutely delicious. <laughs> and high in calories. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. How about you, Holly? What's your favorite food? It depends. So I recently did the coast to coast with a couple of friends, which is from the West coast to the East coast of England. And one thing that I really liked was cheese. Mm. And I'd never really gotten into using cheese on long distance walks before, but I just bought a block of cheese at the store and I was just eating the cheese, like taking bites out of it <laughs> and just wow. eating it like a snack. And I really liked it. I went through three blocks of cheese that week, <laughs> those two weeks. Cause it was just, it was really kind of dense, satisfying, easy to get down and just, I don't know, really good. So cheddar cheese, extra mature cheddar cheese, just a hunk of it. Wow. I've never heard that before. I'm super <laughs> glad I asked. <laughs> Your mileage may vary. You might not work very well with cheese. I've never eaten cheese like that in a race, but for hiking, it was perfect. I think also if there are some flavor water, there's a million different types and they have some calories in them hmm. that, and they have some micronutrients or some sodium. It's an easy way to digest 45 calories or a hundred calories per liter yep. and keep your caloric intake up and kind of replenish some of the sodium that you're sweating out. I sweat a lot. Hmm. So I take in a lot more sodium than your average person. Um, I probably like, if I ever stop working out as much as I am, I, it'd probably be dangerous to eat yeah. as much sodium as I do. But I think that's probably another good way to get in some some sneaky liquid calories. So your body will keep moving. It's a lot, you know, you can burn five, six, seven, 800. If you're not in shape, you might even burn a, a thousand calories yeah. an hour of very vigorous activity. Your body will, there's metabolic adaptation. So somebody who's used to, you know, Holly, at the beginning of your trip, you burned a lot more calories per mm -hmm. hour of walking than the last bit of your trip because your body just adjusts. Yeah. But that's how I do it. Try to easy to chew food is the new, new strategy, not yes. just because it's delicious and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> so what were your favorite parts of this room to room to room adventure? A sneaky favorite was because of the trouble I had had with my friend the trip before when I was going down this time, I decided I'm going to make room in my pack so that I have one or two extra food items. I'm always going to have a little bit extra water. I'm going to have two instead of just a little extra of some very key things, um, chafing materials, yes. uh, supplies, so that when I pass other people, I can ask, how you doing? Because there's probably somebody on that trail. I might not see them because they're too far ahead of me or they're behind me, but it, somebody might need something. And yeah. so that I felt like a sense of community because I was trying to just keep an eye on people. And I also was then not focused on myself because I was yeah. thinking of, oh, I see that person down on the trail and I move pretty fast for a hiker, especially going up. Mm -hmm. And so I'm going to catch up to whoever I see. So I can just ask them, you know, how they're doing to make sure they're okay. Cause there's somebody on that trail that isn't okay. Yeah. So that was probably honestly my favorite part. I like that. Something that I don't necessarily think about because I can go for such long stretches without seeing people here on most of the trails that I walk, that I think that's really nice to have that sense of community on a trail. I probably benefit from nobody's going to like try to mug me or kidnap me. Yeah. You know, I'm a 47 year old dude, so I don't have any like fear of personal safety from other yeah. people. I'm worried about snakes. So I stay on the trail at all times. I never leave the trail. I listen to loud podcasts when I'm walking. I think that scares away 
animals. <laughs> I don't know if it's true. I turn it down when people walk by, so I don't annoy other people on the trail. So maybe that's a benefit. Like I don't have that stress that other people might have. So I just, I like it when I see somebody out somewhere. Yeah. You got pretty good visibility out there. You can kind of tell, even if it's like going to be an hour away mm -hmm. when you're going to see them. I get to see them. And so I'm like, all right, cool. When I do catch them, then I'll see if they're all right. Yep. One thing I forgot to ask you is water. How much water do you think you drank? Hmm. That's a really good question. It was like, I know the calories were mm. between eight to 10,000 calories. And just that day, just while I was in the canyon. And then the water, I'm going to say probably, I don't know what the math of this is, but at least 600 ounces. Uh -huh. That's going to be a guess. So I would keep two of those 32 ounce water bottles mm -hmm. in my front pockets. I have a hiking yep. vest. Mm -hmm. I think I look very cool. My wife and <laughs> teenage kids tell me I look like an absolute idiot with this hiking <laughs> vest, but it has very large front pockets. And I realized, oh, it'll hold one of these 32 ounce water bottles right in it, two of them. And then I have my backpack. It considered like my backup water bag. Mm -hmm. And I drank, I would fill up those two 32 ounce water bottles, every water station. Mm -hmm. And there's nine water stations on the trail I took during the peak months. There's nine water stations inside the Grand Canyon and one on each trailhead. There's a total of 11. So oh, I'm well. thinking at least 10 times I filled up both of these. So at least uh, 600, it could be more. I'm sorry. I don't have a better answer. I did. No, That's not okay. something I tracked and I'm an accountant. So it's like, oh my God, I didn't count something. <laughs> we want the How data. Ridiculous. I feel terrible. Yeah. I'm like, <laughs> oh, oh, I'm going to be called out by my fellow bean counters. Mm. <laughs> so these water sources, are these natural water sources or are they water caches that have been put there? It's a fully functioning like water fountains. Wow. They have a, I'm telling you, it is the most well laid out, well marked it is so obvious where you're supposed to be going. I mean, if you get lost, you're just trying to be an idiot. People who get lost are probably off trying to like take some Instagram picture or something, do something yeah. stupid. It's very, very well laid out. And there are, I mean, literally water fountains that there's an amazing water system that That's is amazing. flowing and it is active during the peak season, which is, I believe, eight months of the year seven or eight months of the year, all nine water stations. If you go the Bright Angel to the North Khabib Trail, if you go South Khabib, instead of having three or four water stations, there's like one mm -hmm. water station. It's supposed to be a beautiful trail and there's much fewer people that go down the South Khabib Trail, but I like the water. So yeah, every um, probably two to four hours, depending on how fast you're walking, there is a, a nice water source. And that's tip number five, folks, is never skip a water station. Mm -hmm. One time, I didn't fill up all my water and it was a really hot stretch and I drank everything I had. I ate an apple and I had like another hour before wow. I got to the next water station. I was like, you know what? I'm never going to skip it ever again. And just like, oh, so never skip a water option on a trail. Mm, yeah. I think that's really important. And I bring those little iodine tablets, uh -huh. but it's supposed to be purified. It's perfectly fresh. You know, I'll, I'll let it run for two seconds in case there's just something at the top of the pipe and I'm the first person to push the button mm. that day. But I've never had an issue on the trail at, on the Grand Canyon. It's really, really nice. And then some people don't know. So there's camping sites. I kind of mentioned that. There's camping sites, uh, I think, in three different spots on the trail. The middle camping site is there's a what they call the Phantom Ranch. And there's this little general store. It's the size of your garage. And it's a little store with a little fountain drink of lemonade that is the wow. most delicious lemonade ever <laughs> in the history of lemonade. And they have cold candy bars and Ooh. they have a treats and you can buy a postcard and send a postcard to your family members or your friends or all your loser friends that didn't come with you. And <laughs> they take the postcards out once a week by mule. And oh, wow. you get a cool stamp on them that says from the Grand Canyon brought out by mule. It's a great uh, fun thing to do. And then you can order in advance a to-go sacked lunch. And I brought all the food that I needed, but as a backup, also ordered a sack lunch from the Phantom Ranch. And it's open from like six in the morning to, I think it's open until 8 p.m. So it's a wide band. The mm -hmm. Phantom, the little general store is open and you can get a little sack lunch with a little apple, a little, some gel, some apple juice, 
I think there was a PB and J sandwich in there. And then you have to have to have to order a glass of the lemonade. Pro tip is bring a cup or a little beverage holding container you know, or just have your water bottle not filled all the way because they charge you extra for the cup. And then there's mm -hmm. no place to stick that cup. Right. So there's no trash cans on the, you have to pack it in, you have to pack it out. So the first time I got the lemonade, it was so delicious. And then I had to carry this cup for like the next 12 hours. Uh, yeah. And so bring a cup or have them just stick the lemonade in your water bottle. Good. That sounds like a plan. So what are your recommendations for someone who might be interested in trying the rim to rim to rim? What are your top tips for preparation or actually doing the trail? Yeah, I'd, I'd work your way up. So at best, if you just do rim to rim, it's going to be 12 hours, take sometimes people 16 hours. And if you're going to do the rim to rim to rim, it's going to take 24 to 36 hours. So you need to work your way up to that. And I would start with some day hikes and then some longer, more strenuous hikes so that you feel comfortable that you physically can handle it. You need to get your nutrition and you need to get your sleep in order. You know, if you have some, I also recommend that you go visit with your doctor and tell mm -hmm. them that you're about to begin a really strenuous exercise program. And do they have any recommendations? Because they'll know your body and maybe yep. any other medications or injuries that you've had in the past and be able to recommend maybe that you see a specialist before you start. I mean, you might need to see a podiatrist so that they can work on some foot issue that you had in the past. So I would start from the beginning. You might think, oh no, I, I did that, you know, when I was out of shape, but now I can run a 10 K. And it's like, this is way different than that. Yeah. It's, it's so much harder than you'd think. It's so easy to go down. The rim to rim to rim doesn't even start until you go down the bright. When you're at the bottom of the bright angel trail, that's when I think your hike has started. Yeah. Um, because it's so easy to go down and the over is a little bit hard, which is like 20 miles mm -hmm. that first up when you realize you're climbing out the North <laughs> rim and that's 8,000 feet. It's, you know, like being on a stairmaster for four hours that mm -hmm. well, you're doing it. You realize you're going up so you could just turn around and go down. Yeah. And it's very hard. So I would say, please work your way up. And while you're doing that, really practice trying to break your gear. You need to eat what you're going to eat in the trail. You're going to drink what you're going to drink in the trail. You need to wear the gear you're going to wear. I'd also recommend a personal locator beacon if okay. you're going to do it by mm -hmm. yourself. They're not that expensive. You can rent them if you do infrequent crazy things like this is the only crazy thing you're going to do then you could just rent a personal locator beacon. I've done that before for a sailing trip. Okay. But if you're going to do some silly things every now and then, it might not be a bad purchase. Mm -hmm. There are reviews online of, of which are the best, but it's something that I have. It gives me peace of mind. It gives my family peace of mind that it's like the Navy SEALs are going to come get you in 20 minutes, but they'll know where to recover the body from yeah. <laughs> or yeah. where you're going to have to try to survive for the next 12 to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. But at least, you know, if you've injured yourself and you just can't move yeah. and you've fallen slightly off the trail and no one's going to come looking for you for a little while, I think it's a good practical piece of equipment as a personal locator beacon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a good idea. So what's the trail like? Is it really technical? Is it really narrow? No, going down, I think is technical. Mm -hmm. I think it's very easy to twist your ankle if you're mm -hmm. not careful going down. It's wide, but steep steps that you know, they have carved into a trail into the canyon. It is uh, very comfortable and the appropriate stride for a mule. That's <laughs> why that, and that you're not a mule. No. So <laughs> it's kind of a double step. You step down half walk, step down, walk, a step down, walk, a step Oof. down. And it's technical and you're going to be putting a lot of weight and weird angles yeah. maybe of your gear. So I think going down is technical. And unless I see young people like running down, I can't do that. So I'd call that technical, but it is wide. And then the across sand, it's a lot like walking in a beach. So Ooh, that's tough. especially from the bright angel trail from the three mile water station to the Phantom Ranch is a lot of sand. There's mm -hmm. probably an hour of just walking in the sand. So just walking in the beach with all your camping gear would probably be good practice for yep. that section, but again, mm -hmm. wide. And then it's another from the Phantom Ranch to the bottom of the North Rim is uh, five or six hours of hiking and it's flat and wide packed sand mm -hmm. and beautiful vistas of the canyon. God's beautiful art and uh, nature's beauty as you're walking. It's a beautiful canvas to see, but it's a long, hot journey. It's much hotter at the bottom than it is at the top. I think hmm. the temperature difference is like 40 degrees. So if it's wow. 60 
at the top of the canyon when mm -hmm. you leave, then it's 30 or 40 degrees warmer at the bottom. It's like an oven. It's baking oh, down there. Wow. So it can be a challenge for people who are not used to the heat. It can be a big complicating factor. And then on the way up, it's so slow. I don't think it's technical. It's like a very well, very organized, laid out trail. It, there are some great YouTube videos of people yep. so you can get a sense. I gave me a lot of encouragement and courage to go on the journey to see men and women doing this tour and talk about their gear and then show you in video the trail, I think is will give mm. you a good perspective of whether or not you think you can do it. They're so inspiring. They don't talk enough about how dangerous it is. Yeah. I think it's a wonderful, great thing, but boy. I don't know if I could recommend it. I'd feel yeah. bad about recommending it, but yeah. I do think it was absolutely awesome. Mm. And did you bring poles for hiking? I didn't. I tried walking with mm -hmm. a pole and I felt like it was extra gear to carry yeah. mm -hmm. during the down and the over, but they are a huge help going up. Yeah. So I questioned that every time I'm in the Grand Canyon, I questioned the decision, but for me, it was, okay, so for 70% of this, thing. I'm just going to be carrying these poles yeah. so that they help me go up. Mm -hmm. And then when I'm going up, I'm going, dang, I wish I had some poles mm -hmm. to use a little bit of arms as I go up. Yeah. But that's the decision that I made. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. So what is the best time of the year to go? Because as you said, there's quite extreme temperatures and it can get quite hot. Yeah, I think that they, I'm going to probably say May or okay. June or September late September would be great. October, it gets really cold. I think it's still open. The whole trail is open, okay. but it'll actually snow and snow a lot at the North Rim. I think in late October, November, the North Rim closes down. It snows so much. There is no lodging at the North Rim and there is no shuttle at the North Rim. Uh -huh. So you need that backup plan. What happens if, well, you're out of luck. Yeah. So I think that would be a very dangerous time. So I think the dates to consider are the May timeframe mm -hmm. or a September timeframe. I've done it in May and June. It was great. And then I didn't mean to do it. It was an accident. It's because of a failed attempt with my friend and I had to get him out of the Grand Canyon for a very early June trip. That didn't work. I wanted to go back and prove to myself I could do it. So I went back, but the earliest I could go back is August and it was very hot. I wouldn't recommend that, but I really, really like the heat. So that was not a problem for me, but I'm a very unusual person. I like everything hotter than the average <laughs> person. So I would say absolutely avoid August. Yeah. Absolutely. 100%. Do not do this in August. Yeah. No, I can't even imagine. I'm not good with heat. So I don't even know if I can handle it in May. <laughs> yeah. It's really quite wonderful in May. It's so beautiful. And this is my understanding. I am not a scientist. This is not my area of expertise. I'm an accountant. So look this up yourself. But that we went from a season of having an ice age to a warming period, the waters that came, the amount, the volume of water was so high and so fast. There were these boulders the size of cars carving these rocks wow. for hundreds or thousands of years. And so it's just like unimaginable scale, these carvings, this yeah. artist's work that you get to be in for 12 hours or 24 hours. It is awe-inspiring. It is amazing. Every turn, there's a new beautiful scene or landscape that's been carved by nature. Mm. And it is unbelievably peaceful and inspiring. It is wonderful. And you kind of forget that it's 100 degrees and you're <laughs> sweating to death because it's just so beautiful. I think you would enjoy it. Just don't go in August. Yeah, it sounds like a solid tip. So Robert, where can people find you online and learn more about what you do? Do you blog at all about your adventures? No, I mean, the thing, I'm kind of a visible expert in the accounting fields, mm -hmm. but I don't really talk about this fitness stuff. It's just a personal journey. I mm -hmm. just did it because I was trying to, on my own little personal wellness journey and I wanted to lose some weight. And since I lost the weight, I wanted to try to do some fitness things and see how far I could run or see how far I could walk. Hmm. And so I'm on LinkedIn. I think I'm the only bean counter that's a Robert Bendetti on LinkedIn, but I don't really talk about the yeah. fitness stuff anywhere else. So hmm. if anybody ever has a question or they need some encouragement, they want to ask me about gear 
absolutely always open to it and welcome to share whatever information I have. And I love learning about other people and would love to learn about other people's stories as on their journeys that they have had in the Grand Canyon. Great. Sounds like a plan. So what's your next adventure? The two next things on my docket are some ultra running things, or again, Mm -hmm. more like ultra jogging. In two days, I have a all day 100K. They call it a backyard run. So it's a little fun take, if you will, on running long distances. It's a two mile track. And the first lap, you get 45 minutes and you can do it however fast you want, but you better be done within 45 minutes because they blow the horn and you go again. And the next lap, you get 44 minutes and then 43, then 42, 41, and so on. And you got to get faster as the day goes on or they kick you off the course. And so my goal is to go fast enough. My goal is to do the 50 miler and my stretch goal is to do the whole 62 miles. But I am a little worried because I can barely run an eight minute mile and I got to run a seven and a half minute mile to finish this. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, I don't know if I'm going to be the fastest I've ever been after running 61 miles. So Mm -hmm. we'll see how that goes, but that's in two days. And then, oh, that's a hundred K. And then in nine months, I'll be right when I finish, I'll be training from nine months from now. I'm doing a hundred mile. It's a 48 hour run. Nice. You just run as much as you can. You just like run, sleep in a tent and then get up and run oh, nice. some more and see if how far you can run. And I'm going to see how far I can run. And where's that? These are all in South Carolina. So oh, nice. nearby, these kind of runs anywhere. If anybody's like, oh, I didn't. If somebody's listening, thinking people only run marathons, there's a few crazy people who run longer than that. And they got them everywhere probably in your town. And there is a small group of crazy people and they put on fun events. So you could do something local. And that's, I just do those kind of things in um, kind of locally. And I like to do obstacle course races too. I don't know, Molly, if you've ever done any of the, like the Tough Mudder or the Spartan stuff, but I love that stuff. stuff. Mm, Oh, you never have? No, no, I haven't. Oh, you got to do that. You would love it. Okay. Well, maybe I'll have have to add that to my list then. (laughs) Oh, for sure. Those are the best. And those are so inspiring because unlike the hiking and the running stuff that we do, most everyone that's out there is like actually a hiker or runner. But for some reason, those obstacle courses, they inspire people who are just beginning on their Mm. wellness journey to go out there and give it a shot for like a little beginner 5k. So there are people out there that you're like impressed they made it to the start line. And it is so inspiring and to help people get over obstacles and like, you know, just hear the motivation, like they've got some huge challenge in their life that they've overcome so much just to get to the starting line. It's like, wow. It's like, it will fire you up. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks. Please drop me a line and let me know what you thought of this week's episode. You can email me at holly at hollywharton.com or find me online and get in touch there. If you enjoy this episode, you might want to check out one of these related episodes. 395, I talk about how to know when to quit your adventures. 370 with Brad Borkin, we discuss how outdoor adventures can help you make better decisions in life. 369, I discuss getting out of your comfort zone with outdoor adventures. 368, I talk with Yvette Webster about how to take your hiking to the next level. And finally, 359 with Adam Wells, we discuss how to prepare for your first long-distance trail. So thank you so much for listening, and remember to visit hollywharton.com forward slash 464 for the first show notes on this episode. Happy trails. Thanks so much for listening to Into the Woods with Holly Wharton. You can find more information about today's episode, including links for topics that were discussed at hollywharton.com. That's H-O-L-L-Y-W-O-R-T-O-N.com. If you'd like to connect with other listeners and get support on your journey, I would love for you to join my private community on Patreon. That's patreon.com forward slash Holly Wharton. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com forward slash Holly Wharton. Thank you so much for listening, and I look forward to seeing you next week.